<laughs> How's everybody doing? All right, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, especially those of you, uh, if you're, this is your first time here today, well, you are going to go on a ride. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, what's nice is you get to do things, uh, you know, a couple services. So this is like the last service. So you already kind of know, you know, this is going to be an adventure today. All right. So anyway, my husband, uh, he's at the 10 a.m. service today. And then I'm going to be doing this morning as well as this evening, six o'clock. And, and what I'm speaking into this morning, I'm going to continue it tonight. So I, I'm just going to invite you to come uh, and, and get all of that. But before I get started, uh, you know, one of the things that the Lord's been starting with me, uh, typically I will get uh, what's a prophetic word for the year. Um, you know, that's very typical. The Lord will tell me the things to come, things to expect, thing to, things to uh, look into, pray into, that kind of thing. And, you know, it's always fresh. It's always new. You know, um, I believe that prophetic people need to have a fresh word, right? They need to have a fresh word, not a stale word, not a, not a word they copied from somebody else's page or, you know, from somebody else's ministry. You need a fresh word. And, and so the Lord has been speaking to me about 2017 and there's a lot behind it. I'm not going to get into it this morning, but, um, maybe, maybe later I'll, you know, another service somewhere out there, I'll, I'll get into it. But he's really been speaking to me about having a hundred year vision and that we need to have a 100-year vision uh, for ourselves personally uh, as well as for our nation, that we actually need to trust that the Lord will actually speak to us for our nation if we ask him to, and that, you know, he will confirm it across the body of Christ. You know, don't discount yourself from ever hearing God on that level. And so um, he was just speaking to me that we, we need to have a 100-year vision. And naturally, when you, when you think of things like that, you know, 100-year vision, my first question was, aren't you going to return by then? And Jesus, you know, and uh, that was really my question, you know, and of course he doesn't answer me because the Bible says nobody knows a day or hour, and, but the scriptures that came to my heart when I asked that question uh, were, were simply this, um, without a vision, my people perish, okay, and then the second thing that came to my heart was that when I return, will I find faith on the earth, okay, and so I realized that we need to have a plan, otherwise we will perish, we need to have a plan because he's looking for faith on the earth, and Jesus will interrupt his plan when it's time to come back. So, so I think sometimes out of our conscientiousness, we put everything on hold, waiting for the return of the Lord, and we have no plan. And people perish. You know, there's like billions of people on the earth. Jesus wants them all. Okay, this plan includes evangelism. This plan includes big things uh, uh, through your life. And, you know, and, and he's been speaking to me about having a pure heart. He's been speaking to me about the pure hearted will we'll see the Lord. We can't see until we have a pure heart. So it's time to rotor rooter, you know, the things going on in our lives and actually live that holy life that Jesus died on the cross for you, you know, to be able to live that. And, and you might have to do some things to get there. But, uh, you know, it, he's been speaking to me about things like that. And, and so, you know, I just want to give you a heads up on that. And then, and then um, I've been working on uh, my, my next book. Um, you probably know that. I, I wrote the Intercessors Handbook uh, that was um, uh, went out last summer, and then I'm um, contracted for this next one that'll go out next, I believe, next fall. And it's called uh, Seeing the Supernatural, um, How to um, Sense, Discern, and Battle in the Spiritual Realm. Really what this book is about is the gift of discerning of spirits. But here's what's underneath it. Is one is, is my personal story about this gift, the gift of discerning of spirits. That's one of the nine gifts we see listed in 1 Corinthians 12. There are more gifts and anointings of, of the spirit, but, you know, we see a nice, a nice grouping there in uh, in the scriptures, uh, such as, um, uh, you know, the gift of prophecy, such as the gifts of healing, such as, um, uh, you know, the, the gifts of miracles, you know, just fantastic supernatural abilities that, that uh, the Holy Spirit is willing to grace you with, grace his church with. It's not for somebody else, it's for you. Think about it. Point to yourself. Say, say I'm a candidate, you know, for the, for the power gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, okay. And so, so anyway, uh, you know, and, and 
uh, so the gift of discerning of spirits is one of those gifts, something that, that the Lord has really uh, has been one of the things I've majored in uh, most of my Christianity. And now, guess what? We're going to actually, um, you know, there's actually going to be a book that's going to come out of this house, this church. It's going to be our experiences. I'm already interviewing some of you. Uh, our experiences is going to go around the globe because we teach it in a way that, 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 that most people don't. Okay, we express, we walk out this gift in ways that most people don't. And what I am finding is that, that the Lord will fashion a message in you through your ups and downs of life, through your history, and he will actually create a message, and he fully intends to take that around the globe. If you ha do you have a yes in your heart for something like that? Okay, and so, so one of the things is I don't want you to discount yourself ever from not being used of the Lord on a global level, but it requires you being a sacrifice. It requires you lay, laying down your life and actually taking up the call of God like you have never taken it up before. A lot of us, we love watching it. We love seeing people operate in it. We love, we love getting the benefit of somebody who, who, who actually operates in a certain gift of God, you know, whether it's a healing or, or deliverance or somebody gives you that prophetic word that just sets your life, you know, in a certain order, you know, and, and it just puts your life in order. We love it. But the Lord's saying, you need to be the one now. We need to be the one now, okay? It's the kiss of God to this earth, a supernatural church who understands his Holy Spirit, understands his ways, and actually walks out in it. Now, here's what I want to tell you, is that there is a supernatural realm. There is a realm of the Spirit that many of us, we have no clue about. We've bumped into it. We've experienced it. We've, we've seen it on TV. They have all those shows you know, shows that are the cultic shows, you know, about mediums and seances and, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, you, uh, you know, those, those, um, uh, those kind of things. We, we've seen it. There is a supernatural realm, but do we know how, how in God, uh, uh, according to his scripture, how to walk in that realm and actually see kingdom results? Because everything starts in the spirit first. Everything, everything going on in your life, something took place in that invisible realm first to bring it forth into your life. And so we got to understand it. We actually have to understand it according to the Bible. We actually have to understand it according to the Word of God. One of the things that I was uh, kind of struck me this morning, I was speaking to the first group, uh, not necessarily that they were participating. I don't know. There's just kind of a look of shock on their face, you know. But one of the things that I've, I've always encountered with Christians is what I call mixture, okay, meaning that they are Christians, they've given their life to Jesus, but they're still looking at the horoscope. They're, they're Christians, they've given their life to Jesus, but they're still celebrating the Day of the Dead, you know, the Christians still, you know, giving their life to Jesus, and, you know, they're, they're still doing fortune-telling games, okay? And you can do none of that, okay? And so, so the thing is, we have to part ways with that. If we want to really walk in the Holy Spirit and actually see the power gifts come through our lives, we have to separate ourselves from those practices. We cannot have mixture. Maybe you don't know. Maybe this is the first time you've ever heard this before. Well, this is great. No problem. There is, there is grace for you to part ways from it and to never, ever get into those things again. But I've always dealt with that with those who are, who are inclined to that realm is that we have to clean out the mixture because the Holy Spirit is so much more powerful. And so I'm going to focus on this gift today, and I'll explain to you why by the time we get to the end of the service today, and then we're going to dive into it even deeper tonight. Um, you know, my daughter and I, we were having this discussion about Santa Claus, you know, this is when she was a young girl, you know, approaching Christmas. And, um, you know, she, want, she wanted to leave Santa a glass of milk and some baked cookies. You know, she expected Santa to, to visit our home in the middle of the night and, and bring her a gift. Now, it's not something my husband and I really, you know, educated her with. I, I don't mind if others do. That doesn't bother me. But it, it wasn't, Santa's not a big deal in our home, okay? But anyway, um, she became a wholehearted believer in Santa because her preschool teacher, 
her uh, preschool classmates. They convinced her this, you know, uh, uh, this fat, fat white guy, you know, come in a sleigh and drop her a gift if she's not on the naughty list. And she says, I'm not on the naughty list. So she was convinced that Santa was going to come. And so, you know, being the purist that I am, I explained about Santa much more accurately. And that led to discussions about the tooth fairy, the Easter bunny, angels, Jesus, witches, and ghosts. Okay, just, we just went through the whole thing. And so, and it turned out my daughter, she was, she, you know, she was a true believer in all things mystical and supernatural in an age-appropriate way. Now, I had already begun instructing her in regards to her cartoon watching, and I said, no witches, no wizards, and no ghosts. Okay, and, and so the reason I said that to her, because, you know, the cartoons are full of that stuff, and I explained to her, I said, those things can be real, okay, but they are evil. And then I explained to her um, that Santa and the Easter Bunny are fun, but they're not factual, and then I said, and I am the Tooth Fairy, And so finally, I reemphasized the reality of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the angels. And we just happened to have this awesome miracle happening at the time. Still happens today, but there's like, like a lot of it at this time. Where we would have what, what I call um, uh, these white feathers, which is kind of burst in the room, like in a service like this, we'd be worshiping God, and all of a sudden you see this burst of white feathers, here or there, you find them on your clothes, or you find them in the prayer chapel, on, or they'd be like one laid neatly on your Bible, you know, I mean, just crazy stuff, people would find them at home, and, and it wasn't like the feather pillows, okay, it was like, you know, it was like like real interesting stuff, and so and so we were, we were finding this stuff during the season, which so emphasized what I needed her to lay hold of, was that angels are real, Jesus is real, the Holy Spirit is real, I wanted her to know what was real, what was not real, and what to avoid, okay? And so that really helped us. Now, I want you to, to keep in mind, I've experienced the supernatural my whole life. Uh, I didn't get saved. I didn't become a Christian until I was a freshman in college, but I've experienced the supernatural my entire life. Um, and, and everything changed once I became a Christian, totally changed after that. But I, I always had these experiences, and, you know, maybe you have too. Um, and, you know, this is why we need the Bible to be our guide so we know what to accept, what to reject. That's really important. And also, you know, as a Christian, you have to understand that the supernatural is a part of our life. Okay, we serve a God who is spirit, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jesus who sits on the heavenly throne. I mean, you know, and, and it's like there, there are angels that are sent to, uh, sent to us to help us. I mean, the Bible is so clear that we are surrounded by the supernatural, whether we, whether we like it or not, whether we accept it or not, that we are walking a supernatural dimension at all times because we are believers in Jesus Christ. And so, so this, this is a part of our world. And when we are in a culture, Culture, a Greek thinking culture that elevates logic and reason above the supernatural. Many times we dismiss it, we won't look at it, we won't accept it, yet it's affecting you. I believe in logic. Logic, you know, uh, uh, balances your checkbook. Logic shows you which classes to take at school to get your degree. Okay? I believe in logic. Logic has to serve the supernatural, not dismiss the supernatural. Amen? And so anyway, uh, you know, this, this is a part of our, our world. And so we, we need to understand it because of what's going on in the supernatural realm is calling the shots in our life, and we have to understand it. We have to get in the word ourselves and begin to understand what God says about it. Uh, uh, we have to get a grid for, for the good things of God. We have to get a grid for what's not okay uh, in our lives. When, when the uh, Bible talks about John 10.10, 10, that the thief, you know, also known as Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy, we have to know who to give credit to what so we know how to pray. You see what I'm saying? We have to know these things. Um, we have to know that there is such a thing as a spirit of infirmity, okay? There's medical sickness where it's, it's a physical infirmity, and then there is a spirit of infirmity. And you have to discern the difference because you have to have the right application, okay? And we miss all of this because we, we, we don't, we, don't uh, 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 we discount the spiritual side of things. I have found that in my life, like the, the major illnesses that I have dealt with in my life, they all had a spiritual root, every single one of them. And once we 
got hold of what the spiritual root of it was, I, I broke free of it. All right, and it's, it's just a thing that we have to begin to open our eyes to, begin to, to consider, begin to study, begin to, to, to talk to people about who know about this um, and, and are biblical in their application. Now, when a non-Christian experiences the supernatural, it creates a hunger in them because non-Christians, those who don't believe in Jesus, they're experiencing uh, the supernatural as well. How many, how many uh, have encountered the supernatural in some dimension before you knew Christ? How many of you? Just Raise your hand. See all over the room. And so, um, you know, the problem is they don't know how to discern it. They don't know how to sort through it. If their home becomes haunted, for example, they don't know that that spirit has no right to be there. Okay, they don't know that you need to cast it out unless it's like turned into a poltergeist on you. Okay, they, they don't know. And then they're calling shamans and, and witch doctors and, and to, to try to get it out. Okay, they, they don't know what to do with it. Um, you know, or if they start exhibiting psychic or tel, uh, telepathic uh, abilities, they don't know where to put that. Um, and they start uh, reaching out to new age sources, occult sources to get help when they need to reach out to the church. Okay, this is why we need to be a supernatural community so people know where to go when they're having troubles like this, all right? And so, you know, we, we uh, uh, those who are needing, you know, physical healing, personal deliverance from evil spirits, because they know they, they have a demon spirit. They know it. I've talked to people who are not Christians. They know they have a demon spirit. They don't know where to go to get help. They go to brujas. They go to shamans. They go to all of that. And it doesn't lead them to Jesus. It doesn't lead them to Jesus. We have to be a supernatural church. Now, my first spiritual experience, it took place when I was just three years old, okay? And this is a lot of people's stories. They remember the first time they encountered something. They bumped into something. A lot of people are like this. And mine was when I was three, and I was with my mother in Reno, Nevada. That's my birth home. My biological father was absent at the time. And I remember at night, there was a, a woman that was in my closet, and she would just float didn't say anything, didn't move, just she'd float off the floor, long hair, dark hair, no clothes, and she was there all the time at night. I finally said something to my mom. I said, you know, something like, you know, there's a woman in my closet. Mom investigates, shut the closet door. You know, that's the end of that conversation. You know what I'm saying? But I, I remember that very distinctly. That was my first, first time. I began noticing that I'm, I'm encountering this other realm. Okay, but there's, there's no filter. There's, you don't know where to put that. You don't have any language for it. And then I, as, I, as I got older, uh, you know, we, we actually uh, moved to California. My mother remarried uh, to my stepfather. He was a Mormon. And so we naturally became a Mormon family, LDS family. Any Mormons in the room? Sometimes, sometimes we have Mormons here, so just wanted to find out. Um, and so, you know, went, went uh, you know, in, in that house, everything was, seemed pretty you know, pleasant and peaceful, and but I started hearing voices in that house. That the the the, the woman in the closet, she stayed in Nevada, and then now in this house, there are voices. I'm hearing people talk. I'm hearing I'm I'm you know hearing people speak, and you know I don't know what to do with that. I just know that I felt like I was getting pulled into some other world. I felt like I was being pulled into conversation with something invisible. I didn't know what to do with that. My mother actually took me to the doctor because she thought I couldn't hear. Okay, and, and the doctor said that, that I was fine. And really what it was is, I mean, maybe I wasn't listening to her at times, but really what was happening, I had no language for it, is I was getting pulled into this other world, and I, I was checking out. Okay, and this world was so real to me, all right, and without prompt, without response, without, or without conditioning or anything like that, when, when I was about seven, I had some girlfriends come over uh, from the LDS church, and I had them in my room, and I, I just said, hey, do you, wanna, do you want me to call a ghost into the room? Okay, and you're like, well, what made you do that? I have no idea. And so I, my girlfriends are like, oh, okay, let's do it, you know. And so, and so I, I just said, I just uh, called a ghost into the room, and the, the paper started fluttering on my wall and stuff like that. We didn't think anything about that, all right? But what I didn't know is that I was actually inviting demons into my life without knowing it. Okay, and so, you know, uh, uh, fast forward into my teen years, I started getting more intentional about occultism. The other stuff was just like, it was just there, you know, I was just tapping in. You know, and that's when I, I remember uh, using a Ouija board, and we were talking about this earlier earlier this morning, I had some people, uh, I had someone uh, catch me in the back, you know, needing some prayer over this. You know, and I think they have a movie out now. 
They have a movie out now. And, and you know, it's, uh, and I was using it. And, and the thing is, um, <laughs> the thing is, I, I actually uh, connected with a familiar spirit. Now, the Bible is very clear about familiar spirits, that they are demonic. It is idolatry. You do not connect with familiar spirits. You do not do seances, okay? Because you're, you're de- you think that you're dealing with your dead relative. No, you're dealing with a demon. Okay, they lie. They totally lie to you. And that's what I did. I connected with a demon thinking it was a dead relative. But I could feel the darkness on it, and so I never did it again. And then my girlfriends and I, we do those stupid teenager occultic games that you do, you know, like Bloody Mary, uh, Charlie, Charlie, you know, whatever. And, you know, fine, except for we were actually tapping in at times, okay, inviting demons into our world, okay? And you can't play with those things without a consequence, There's always a consequence uh, uh, when you mess with things like that. And then when it got really heavy, it was as a Mormon, you do go to the temple, you you do rituals, and they're all for the dead. And not that they're perverse, not that they're scary, but they are very, um, you know, uh, very spiritual and, and ritualistic. And so you basically put into the baptismal waters, you invoke the name of 10 to 20 deceased persons, you are baptized on their behalf, you are confirmed on their behalf, you are, uh, hands are laid on you uh, uh, on their behalf by the elders, and you do receive something, you know, comes over you as a result of that. And so, you know, by the time I was, the you know, junior in high school, 16, 17, 18, you know, we, we we had some very severe family issues on top of it, and I was just bottoming out. I started to bottom out. I was having um, uh, demonic manifestations where your, my bed would shake. Um, I would hear screaming uh, outside of my window, and it was like a, a sound that it felt like it put an instability in your mind. Um, uh, you know, I was experiencing darkness. I felt like a perceptible darkness around me, and none of that shifted until uh, my crazy uncle invited me to his crazy Pentecostal church. And, you know, I was so desperate. I went, and that's when I gave my life to Jesus. Um, it's not even a church I think anybody should go to, to be honest with you, but Jesus met me there. And so, you know, and I gave my life to Jesus. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I began to live my life for Christ. I, I did away with occultic stuff. I knew it was wrong. By that time, I knew it was all wrong. I never, there was no mixture in my life. I wasn't like horoscoping and then trying to get a prophetic word by the prophetic team at the same time. You know, I wasn't nothing like that. And I was just, honestly, as much as I knew to live for Jesus, I was. And then about a year later at a prayer service, um, uh, these ladies were praying for me. And one of the ladies looked at me and she says, I see a spirit of sorcery standing over you. And when she said that, something picked me up and threw me against the wall, and I went into a grand mall demonic manifestation, like the stuff you see on the movies, okay? And that's what happened to me because I didn't know that there is a payback. There's a consequence every time you deal with stuff like that, that you actually have to go before the Lord and repent of every act of occultism that you've ever participated in, that it doesn't go away. It actually is a time bomb. It's like an unlocked door, and the thief may not be in your neighborhood today, but he will be tomorrow, and once he finds the door, he comes in and he messes with your world. When I see families that have witchcraft on them, I'll see uh, uh, childhood deformities. I'll see children that go into rebellion for no reason. We'll see weird perversion, okay? We'll see this trail, this trickle down uh, into the family. And so this is why we have to cut all those things off. I thank God that's the way it went down for me, that it, that it got exposed just like that. Some people, it doesn't get exposed. It hides. And then later on in life, they can't get victory. They can't get breakthrough. And they don't know why. It's because they never cut ties with those things. You have to cut ties with it. Okay? And so, so you know, working through that, okay, after I got delivered like that, the Holy Spirit, he is so good. Okay? He is so good. And, I'll, you know, um, you read the Intercessor Handbook, you can see the the uh, how that deliverance happened. They actually couldn't get me delivered. I actually actually took some time. I had to learn my authority in Christ, and God is good. He taught me, and I got set free. But what happened, because the Holy Spirit is good, he gave me a gift, and he gave me the gift of discerning the spirits, and that is a gift that lets you see in the dark, lets you know uh, what is hidden, lets you know, um, uh, uh, it puts you in the know, and everything that's hidden, you get to see. Okay, so that you'll never be deceived and that you know how to pray and that, you know, you you can handle life intelligently because you see the spirit behind the circumstance. All right. And so and it's a powerful, powerful gift. 
But where we are missing it, friends, and I'll go into this tonight, is the way this gift operates. We see it in the Bible. We see it, it manifesting. We see the end result. But there is never any instruction or hardly any instruction about the process. How do we discern things? What is the process? What does it feel like? What do you go through when you are discerning something? You know, and, and just a, a, a snapshot for tonight, Hebrews 5.14, New American Standard Version, says that those who are mature will actually discern good and evil through their senses. In other words, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your taste, your, your, what you feel on your skin, your emotions, you will discern everything through, almost everything through, the, through those mechanisms. And if you don't know you have this gift, you'll think you're going crazy because you're having mood swings, because you're seeing things, because you're hearing things, and what you're hearing the spiritual, you're feeling things, you don't know why you're feeling it, and you have to actually have to go to the teacher, the Holy Spirit, to teach you why are you feeling what you feel? Why are you seeing what you see? And if you don't know how you have a gift, you think you're bipolar, you think you're schizophrenic, and you end up in the doctor's office. So I'm here to tell you there might be something better going on in your world, okay? I, I do believe you should check it out with a doctor, but go to a spirit-filled doctor. Go to a Holy Ghost-filled doctor who knows this stuff so they can diagnose you correctly. Amen? Amen. And so I'm bringing this to you because let me tell you what's on the horizon, okay? And I want you, to, uh, Harvest Christian Center, to always believe that God is going to use you to do something uh, uh, tremendously impactful, that God does not bypass anybody. He, he makes no excuse to bypass you, that, that it doesn't matter what your age is, it doesn't matter what your education is, that if you have a yes in your heart, the Lord will fill in the gaps and do something powerful through your life if you will say yes and you will make that sacrifice. Um, and so I want you to know that, that Harvest Christian Center has a local impact, you know, reaching the city. It has a global impact influencing the nations. A book is coming out of this house. It's going to go around the globe about this gift right here that I'm telling you. And so guess what? You get to hear it first. You get to learn this first. You get to walk this out first because the days ahead, the church gets more glorious right? The church gets more powerful. Read your Bible. It's all there. The church gets more, more, um, uh, gets stronger. And, you know, cause Jesus is coming back for, for a beautiful bride, not a broken bride, right? Okay. You got that right. And, and, but on, on top of it, the earth does get darker. We've seen it in the last decade. What does that mean? People who are coming in for salvation, people who you are reaching out with the gospel of Jesus Christ, make that your lifestyle because that's why you're here. Okay. Those are people, they will all need deliverance. They will need you to do what Jesus did, and that is to go about doing good, healing all who are oppressed of the devil. Okay, one of the things that as believers we do, Mark chapter 16, is that we cast out demons. You will, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you will cast out demons, but you can't do that if you can't discern it. You can't see it. You can't help people who need this. And they need freedom. There's nothing like having, uh, uh, being bound to something like that, that's my story, and having it leave you. Your whole world changes. And so we need this gift active in us, and we need to get it. We need to understand it. We need to be people who really embrace the supernatural because that's where it's all at. And it is nobody else's responsibility but ours. It is our responsibility. There is a world out there that needs what you have to, uh, uh, to bring freedom to them because they're not free right now. And so this is what's on the horizon. We're going to talk about deliverance. We're going to get good at it. We're going to learn how to deliver ourselves. We're going to learn how to help our neighbor. You know, no matter where you're at in your Christianity, there is always a point in time where you need more deliverance. Okay, it just goes with the territory. We get our feet dirty, okay, as we preach the gospel. Okay, and, and people coming in, they're going to need deliverance. we got to get comfortable with this kind of stuff, not, not freak out over it, not, not get, get overwhelmed with it, okay? And so, so there's a whole new thing that we, we need to lay hold of and grab hold of, you know, so that we can be in step with what the Spirit is doing in this time and this season. Can I hear an amen? I'm going to have you stand right now. I'm going to have the worship team come up. 
Now, there are probably some people here today that you, you have not made, made a, a commitment to Jesus Christ. You were like me. You were, you were struggling. You were, you were in stuff. You, you were bottoming out, and you didn't even know this Jesus, okay? And I want to introduce you to Jesus today and how powerful and how loving he is and that he truly, truly died for you. He, he died for it all. There's no condemnation, you know, because of it. But you, you have to lay your life down and give your life to him. He doesn't force his, himself into your world. He invites you. The invitation is always open, um, you know, and, and he is a better way. And if that's you and you'd like to give your life to Jesus, we're going to actually pray together. But if you'd like to give your life to Jesus right here, right now, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. Just say, I want to give my life to Jesus over here. Anybody else? I want to give my life to Jesus. Just say, I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to surrender. I need to give my world to him. I need to lay my life down for him. Just raise your hand. I know there's more people in the room. This, uh, uh, today's the day of salvation. We don't wait until we get it all together. You can't get it together without Jesus Christ. Okay, okay. Heavenly Father, just pray with me. Heavenly Father, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I repent of my sins. I invite you to be the Lord of my life. I surrender to you. I invite you to baptize me in the Holy Spirit. I renounce any other demonic spirit. And I give you all the days of my life. Well, we just thank you that there is a celebration in heaven over those right now who just made that commitment. Amen. There is a celebration. God is 